Um, so basically, the network layer um, on the OSI model, it is the, the third layer on the original TCP IP model was the second um, layer and on the updated TCP IP model, mo model, it is the third layer. Now, um, it's a bit of, it's a last slide, so I'm just gonna run for quickly. If anyone has any questions, they can um, um, raise those questions and um, try to answer them as we go along. Okay, now what is the TCP IP network layer? Um, this is the layer that transmits data across the network utilizing the internet protocol. Data packets received from the transport layer are assigned a packet header that includes the source and destination addresses for the packet to be transmitted. So that's what allows the, the packet to know where it's coming from and where it's going to and how it's routed across the different networks. Um, and these IP addresses allow data to be routed through different networks, no matter how far they are from each other, and also to help identify the best route for the traffic. And this here is just a diagram of um, how data is transmitted across the different layers. So from the application la layer, you'd have the request for data it goes on to the transport layer where a TCP header is added. Then when it gets to the internet layer, an IP header is added, which as I mentioned, includes the source and destination addresses. And then from the, the network layer or IP layer used to be called, it then goes down to the network access layer where it is physically transmitted to the other network or other host. This is a depiction of what an IP data packet looks like. So on the left hand side, you see it includes a number of different information, the version of the IP protocol being used. Um, we have um, typically IPv4 and now IPv6. It includes information such as the total length of, <coughs> sorry, the total length of the data being transmitted, it has things such as a time to live, which is how long the, how many hops the pack should take be, um, before it expires, the source and destination address, um, the um, information for various options, and of course the data itself. And on the right hand side, we can see um, basically how data is encapsulated, encapsulated as it goes, as the different um, headers are added. Um, you have the senders and receivers IP address, and then when it goes down to the data link layer, the sender's MAC address and receiver's MAC address is also added. So IPv4 addresses, um, or IP addresses that we normally refer to them, um, identify a host on a network and identify various IP networks. Um, these addresses are 32 bits long and represented in four segments of eight bits each, which are usually called an octet or a byte. And although the true representation of IP addresses is in binary, um, they're usually displayed in decimal format so that they can be easier read and each octet is separated by a dot. So at the bottom you can see a uh, depiction of what an IP address would actually look like in binary and what it, the corresponding decimal notation is. And in a little later, we'll go more in the depth into the difference between binary and decimal. And well, that's the next section. So binary numbers um, are called base two because they only use two digits, zero and one to represent all numbers. Um, by contrast, decimal numbers are base 10, they use the numbers zero to nine, which is 10 digits in all to represent the numbers. And binary numbers are utilizing computing and computer programming since um, the components of computers, which are transistors, are essentially switches, which can either be in an on or off position. The off position represented by a zero and the, one, and the on position represented by a one. So that's why binary is essentially the base language of computing. Um, 
obviously because humans are accustomed with decimal numbers it can be difficult to read in binary so binary numbers are usually converted into decimal for easier display and manipulation now, in order to convert a binary number to decimal, um, there are a number of different um, methods that can be used. Um, one is on display here. Um, so again, since binary numbers only use zeros and ones, um, every single number in a binary number is composed only of that. Um, the, no the decimal numbers one, two, three, four, and five, uh, the equivalent binary numbers would be one, one, zero, one, one, 100 zero zero and 101 one respectively and to convert binary numbers to decimal each position in a binary number starting from the right hand most side would be calculated by using a power of two an increasing power of two so here you can see starting from the right host the right most side you have this binary number where the first digit is a one and if you multiply that by two to the power of zero that gives you a one. The next digit to the power of one. The next digit, and again coming from the right hand side, the next digit is a zero, so that remains a zero. Um, the next digit is the one two to the power of three that gives you eight. Then two to the power of four gives you sixteen. Then another zero, and then two to the power of six is sixty-four, and finally two to the power of seven is one twenty-eight. When you add all those numbers up, you get the number. To 19, which is the digital, the decimal representation of this binary number. Converting decimal to binary, um, again, there are different methods that can be used. Um, you can either use a subtraction method, should be depicted on the left hand side, where you would subtract based on the highest binary number that the that you can be subtracted from and continue progressively subtracting until you get to zero. And for each subtraction, you put a one. If in a particular position, there is no number, and that number cannot be subtracted, you leave a zero. So in the example here, 128 can be subtracted from 156. And so you put a one in the position of the 128 bit. Um, the remainder is 28, which can be subtracted by 16. So you put a one in the 16 position, the remainder is 12, which can be subtract, it can be subtracted for that, from that, you put another one, and then the four, subtracted from four gives you zero. Um, the example on the right hand side uses a division method where you divide the number by two. And if you don't have a remainder, you use a zero. If you have a remainder after dividing by two, you put a one in that position. Moving on to IP addresses. So an IP address represents a host in much the same way as a person's physical address represents their say, country, street, um, building, and apartment number in which they reside. Uh, every IP address has two sections. The first section represents the IP network which is equivalent to, some, to say the, of a person's city, street and building, while the second section represents the host on that network. For example, a person's apartment number. Um, a network mask, which we'll discuss a little further later on, determines which bits in an IP address represents the network and which represent the host. And here we have a depiction of what an IP address looks like both in decimal format and in binary format. So here you can see the entire, on the left-hand side this is, the entire IP address is 32 bits or four bytes. And each bit is separated by, into different, into four octets and converted into decimal, you get the IP address 172.16.254.1. And on the right hand side, you can see here an um, IP address is segmented into the network part and the host part. And then at the end, you have the, uh, the representation of the subnet mask. So in this situation, the 192.168.1 represents the network and the 20 represents the host on that network. 
24 indicates that that subnet mask has 24 bits. And again, using an analogy of an IP address being similar to a street address, um, here you can see the network part will rep essentially represent the street and the host part will represent the, ho the house, the various house that a person would live. So it's just a representat representation so you can understand the difference between um, network and host sections of an IP address better. Additionally, there is a dif differentiation between public and private address IP addresses, which we'll be discussed shortly. Now, every host on a network has the same. Every host on, on the same network has the same network address, and every host on the same network must have a different host address. Now, every network has what are called a, ID, a network ID and a broadcast address. The first address in an in an in a network in an IP network or a IP subnet represents the network ID. Each subnet has a unique network ID separate from all other networks. Exceptions in the case of private networks, we will discuss shortly. And the last IP address on a network is the broadcast address of that network. And for this reason, the total number of hosts on any IP network is always the Total number of IP addresses minus two. IP address classes. Um, IP addresses are organized in various classes that determine how much of an address is used for the network and how much is used for the host. The class of an IP address also determines how many IP networks can exist with a certain, within a certain class and how many hosts can exist on a specific class of IP network. Uh, there are five classes of IP network, although only three are used. And although there are these um, IP classes, subnetting and variable length subnetwork mass have led to a reduction to, in the, rigid, the use of rigid classes and classless interdomain routing or CIDR has replaced classful addressing in most implementations. And here we have the various IP classes. So you have class A, B, and C, which are typically used. Um, D is reserved for multicast addresses, and E is also reserved. So class A are uh, eight bits, and sorry, the network, in the class A IP address, um, the network is, uses eight bits, and the host uses 24 bits, so out of the total, for the two bits that the address has, eight bits of that is reserved for the network and 24 bits is reserved for the host. Now, obviously the higher number of bits used for either the networks or host determines the amount of networks you could have and the amount of host. So for a class A um, IP address, there can be a total of 125 networks and a total of over 16 million hosts on an individual class A IP network. And the class um, AIPs start from 1.0.0.1 all the way to 1. Dot, sorry, all the way to 127.255.255.254. Um, class B, 16 bits for the network and 16 bits for the host can have over 16,000 class B networks and over 65,000 hosts on a class B network. And class C, you have 24 bits reserved for the network and eight bits reserved for the host. So you can have a total of over 2 million class C, individual class C IP, IP networks. And each class C IP network can only have 254 hosts. And as I mentioned earlier, we have what are called private IP addresses. Um, certain ranges of IP addresses are reserved for private internal network use and not used on the public internet. Um, they're utilized by organizations and home networks for internal communication only. Um, any communication between an internal host using a private IP and another host on the public internet must have its host converted to a public address through what's called network address translation or NAT. 
And since private addresses are for internal communication, hosts on separate local networks can have the same private address. So for example, if you have two different companies and each company is using private IP addresses for their internal com computers, you can have a computer at company A having the same IP address as a computer at company B, but because they are internal IP addresses and they're not um, communicating with each other, they, they would, you would not have a conflict in that point. If traffic needs to be transmitted from company A to company B, when it connects to the public internet, that private IP address will be converted into a public IP address using network address translation so that the company B will see the traffic coming from company A's public IP address. And these are the private IP addresses that are in use. So we have um, class A, class B, and class C I public, um, private IP addresses. And here you can see the range of IP addresses that are used for each of, for each of these classes. Um, for class A, it's 10.0.0.0 as a network up to 10.255.255.255. For class B, you have 172.16.0.0 all the way to 172.31.255.255. And class C, private IP address is 192.168.0.0 up to 192.168.255.255. And of course, because of these are different classes, there are different amounts of of um, networks you can have on each of these classes and the different amount of hosts. So class A private addresses are usually used for very large enterprises. Class B would typically be used for medium-sized enterprises and class C private IP addresses would usually be used within a home network. And then we're getting into IP subnetting. So subnet mask identify which sections of an IP address representing the network and which section represents the host. And adjusting the subnet mask allows subnetting of a network, which is essentially breaking up, breaking it up into a network, breaking up a network into smaller manageable networks. So for example, in the examples we had um, earlier, we had different class A, class B, and class C um, networks those could be further, further broken down into smaller networks. So here we have an example where <clears throat> you have an IP 8.20.15.1 and you see the network, the, um, the network mask is 255.0.0.0. So the network part of that IP address is eight and the host part is the 20.15.1. And subnetting allows you to create multiple logical networks within a single class A, B, or C network. Uh, splitting a network into multiple subnets reduces the total number of hosts since each subnet will have two IP addresses reserved for the network ID and broadcast address, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, however, separate subnets reduce broadcast traffic on the overall network and can be used to segment your network traffic for a variety of reasons. So some of the reasons for subnetting, um, if, a subnet, if a network is spread across several different locations, it will be prudent to create separate, separate subnets for each location. Local traffic, including broadcast traffic at each location will remain within the local subnet and not flood the entire network. Um, Subnet can also be used, utilized for security reasons. Um, for example, if you wanted to separate the traffic from the marketing department from the finance department, giving your network an additional layer of security. And subnetting should especially, especially be used to separate different types of traffic that have different bandwidth, quality of service, and security requirements. For example, um, VoIP traffic, surveillance camera traffic, guest Wi-Fi, and regular network traffic should be kept separate from each other by utilizing um, separate subnets. 
Okay, and here we have an example of subnetting. So using three additional bits from the host portion of the network, the network can be split into additional subnets. Um, so here we can see that the subnet mask, instead of using the typical class C, which is 255.255.255.0, we are utilizing three bits from the host portion and add that to the network portion. And so the network mask becomes 255.255.255.224. And out of the 32 bits of the mask, 27 are used for the network. So that is considered to be a 27 bit network mask. And to calculate the number of subnets and hosts, uh, the number of bits that are taken from a host portion of a address dictate how many subnets can be created as well as the maximum number of hosts on each subnet. The number of subnets is available is two to the power of the subnet bits. And the number of hosts available is two to the power of the host bits minus two. Again, the two IPs are reserved for the network ID and the broadcast address. So in the previous example, we saw that we use an additional three bits from the, the host portion. So to calculate how many different subnets we can break that single network into. It will be two to the power of three, which is equal to eight. So that's eight available subnets. And five bits were left over for the host portion. So two to the power of five, which is 32 minus two, leaves you with 30 hosts per subnet. So out of those eight subnets, each of them can have 30 hosts on, on them. Now, subnetting is not a one size fits all. Um, sizes should be calculated to maximize the number of IP addresses available for each subnet while taking future growth into consideration. Um, subnets that are too large for the number of hosts on the network waste IP addresses, while subnets that are too small would not have enough addresses available. And the more subnets created and the smaller the subnets um, that, sorry, the more subnets created and the smaller subnets, um, yes, sorry, just got <laughs> just rereading what I wrote there. Um, so the small, the number, the more subnets created and the smaller subnets, the less um, IP addresses you have available for the host, considering that each subnet has to have a network ID and a broadcast address. So the more you break up a network into different subnets, each ad each additional subnet that's created takes away two IP addresses that are used for the network ID and the broadcast address of each of those subnets. Um, examples of some of how you could break up a network into different subnets. So say we had um, this network here, 172.16.0.0 starting, starting off and we want to break it up into se separate subnets for different type of types of traffic. So first we have 81 workstations. So we want to ensure that we have enough IP addresses for those stations, but we don't want to use too much. So if we use a normal class C address, that would have been 254 hosts, but we only need 81 with a little room to grow for future, for future um, growth. So we would break that up and use a 25-bit subnet, giving us a total of 126 hosts. And you can see the range of where the IPs would start and end. Next, we have some VoIP um, IP phones. We have 56 of them. So we can use a 26-bit network mask, which will give us a total of 62 hosts and that will be sufficient for the number of IP phones we have on our network. Then we have 59 surveillance cameras. Again, a 26-bit network mask would be sufficient to break up, to create a subnet, a subnet with 64 hosts. And then we have um, for internal Wi-Fi and guest Wi-Fi. Now, if you look at the subnet, you'll notice that the in terms of the number and scheme of the, of the IPs, I put the guest Wi-Fi before the internal um, Wi-Fi where the 
guess why if I would start at the 172.16.1.1, which comes just after the surveillance, instead of putting the internal Wi-Fi immediately after the surveillance. And the reason for that is that when you are subnetting, you always have to put your larger subnets in sequence first before the, the smaller subnets. Um, if I had tried to, in other words, because the internal Wi-Fi is only going to use a subnet with 30 hosts, the larger guest Wi-Fi net, um, subnet, which needs 64 hosts, had to come before the internal Wi-Fi subnet. Um, Internet Control Message Protocol, or ICMP, um, is used for network devices, include routers to send error messages, error messages and operate operational information indicating success or failure when communicating with another IP address. For example, an error is indicated when a requested service is not available or that host or router could not be reached. An ICMP error message usually, usually contains the full IP header, including options of the IP datagram that failed and the first eight bytes of the IP data field. Um, some common um, tools used for you that utilize ICMP are the ping command and the telnet command, which are very useful in identifying issues with um, network traffic and communication. Um, and then we have the types of um, communication. We have unicast, which is used for one-to-one -one communication. And examples of unicast communication is um, sending an email, accessing information from a website, send a text message, or a one-to-one -one call, example, a WhatsApp call. And IPv4 unicast addresses must be globally unique to the network and have a uniform format. Multicast is used for one-to-many communication, example, a streaming broadcast, a conference call, such as this one um, on Zoom. So I'm speaking, but it's going to all of you at the same time. So that would be an example of a multicast um, traffic. Also, send an email to a mailing list can be an example of multicast. And then we have broadcast, which is used for one to from one to any, everyone on the subnet. Um, packets sent to IPv4 broadcast addresses are processed by all the interface, interfaces on the subnet. IPv4 routers do not forward network broadcast packets. And a DHCP client must use the limited broadcast address, which is 255.255.255.255 for all traffic sent until the DHCP server acknowledges the use of an of offered IPv4 address configuration. So a client looking for an IP address would send out a signal to every um, host across the entire network until it gets an IP address. And finally, questions. So let me just go okay. On. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you have a question in the chat. So just okay. pick that question and, you know, Okay, so I'm gonna look at the questions right now. Okay, how can you know whether an IP is public IP address or private IP address, and how can you calculate the broadcast address? So um, you might have seen from the slide that the, the a public IP address is a specific um, range. Um, it's, it is, you can't use just any IP address you want as a private IP address, um, there are specific ranges for the class, for the class A is, is 10 dot, it starts from the um, 10.0.0.0 um, all the way to 10.255.255.255. Class B were the um, 172.16.00 all the way to 172.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
One second. All right, so here you have it again. These are the ranges for private IP addresses. Any address that is outside of those ranges will be considered a public IP address. A private IP address. No, what I say is anything outside of those ranges would be a public IP address. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. And then okay, let me see what's the next question. Okay, that's the only question so, I'm so seeing. Now, um, talking about a public IP address, you have to specify that um, it is the range of uh, the unicast addresses that is class A, class B, and class C. So um, class, class D and class E are not like um, for normal unicast communications. Uh, meanwhile, there are some other ranges that are reserved like uh, the 127.0.0.0 slash uh, eight, which is reserved for um, loopback yes, addressing. Cool. So there are many of those, like the zero, 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 zero is reserved for the entire network, the, the global network. So uh, it has to fall under the ranges which you presented, class A, class B, and class C. That's, that is correct. And there's also a 169, um, address. I can't remember the, the exact um, range, but there is an address um, for that is utilized if uh, a computer does not receive an IP from DHCP. It allows com computers to communicate with each, with each other internally, but they can't communicate outside of their own internal network. Yeah, it's called the APIPA. It's, it's called a PIPA range. It's a range from uh, Microsoft, actually. Actually, by default, it's a public it's a public range. But Microsoft decided to use it um, for when, like, if you are in a DHCP network and your computer cannot like get a, an IP from a DHCP server, it will fall back f uh, to an IP from that range. Yes. I'm seeing another question. Um, can you help me? So how to calculate the, 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 the second part of the question from Jean-Claude is how to calculate broadcast addresses. How do you calculate broadcast addresses? Okay, so in any, when, when you calculate um, the, the range of IPs for, the, for a, a subnet, the very first IP always represents the network ID and the very last IP within that range represents the, the um, broadcast address. Now, in terms of um, identifying what the range is, again, it depends on the number of bits used. So as I showed you earlier, and I'll go back to that, um, to that screen, let's see if I can find it. Okay, so as, as I indicated earlier, so when, you, when you're breaking up a, a, a network class into different subnets, you um, identify how many bits are being used and two to the power of the number of bits being used for the subnet would tell you how many subnets and then the amount of bits left for the host you have two to the number of host bits mm -hmm. minus two will give you the number of host. And then based on that, you know how many IP addresses are available on that, on that um, particular subnet. And the very last IP on that subnet becomes the broadcast address of that subnet. I hope that is um, clear. Okay. And then um, how to cut? Okay, let me see. Hold on a second. So um, you could also say um, when you are when you are doing subnetting, um, all right, an IP address as you presented has two parts: the network part and the host part. Now, when you're doing subnetting, it means that you are taking some bits from the host part to create what we call the subnet ID. And that subnet ID is made up of some bits. Now, 
at that net at that uh, uh, subnet ID, when all the bits in the subnet ID are zero, that is the network uh, host. That's the network I, I, a network uh, identifier or the network address. Meanwhile, when all the bits at the host part are ones, that is the broadcast ID. Okay, so you can proceed. Okay. Um, I need some clarification on destination NAT and what applications it's implemented in. Okay, so typically, um, network, ad network address translation is handled by a firewall. Um, so just to use a, a very basic example, um, if you have a internet router at your home, you, have, you get internet from, the, from your ISP and you have a Wi-Fi network at home, the IP addresses you'll get from your Wi-Fi router at your home would be private IP addresses. Um, usually it'll be within the 192 range. But then when it um, connects to the, when the traffic is going out to your ISP to go out for the internet, your internet router, whether it's um, um, cable modem or DSL or fiber, um, whatever it is, the router would have a public IP address from your your ISP. So even if you have 10 different devices at your home, you have your laptop, your, your cell phone, your tablet, your, your, your other family members have devices on, on the network. When traffic is going out to the internet, <clears throat> the, in, the internal private IP address is translated into the public IP address that your router has from the ISP and that is the address that the traffic will appear to come from. So if you are communicating with someone across the world, they will see all traffic coming from your home all comes from that one um, public IP address that you have from your ISP. <clears throat> and the way that that works is that it, um, although all the, the internal devices are communicating using that one public IP address, the router can differentiate the traffic between the different devices by using different ports. So <clears throat> traffic from your laptop might be on one port, as while well, traffic from your cell phone might be on another port, etc. So it's, it uses different ports to, to determine which device it is, um, it is um, handling traffic on. That, all that is done internally on the router. From the outside world, they, it doesn't distinguish between different devices as far as the outside world is concerned. It's just one device it's talking to and all traffic from is coming from that one device. But when it comes to the router, the router would se separate that device with a different um, host on your internal network using um, different ports. Okay, so um, that's, that's good. Um, and, and there are two types of nuts. There is, okay, there are many types, but in terms of um, how NAT works, NAT is network address translation. It means when I send a packet, there is a source. There is a source address and there is a destination address. Now there is a box in the middle. Let's say this is my network. I have my host here. The host is connected to a middle device, which is, let's say, a router and this router is connected to the internet. Now, there is an IP address here. There is another IP address here, and this host has an IP address. So here you have an IP, which most of the time is a public IP. Meanwhile, here people use private IPs. Okay, so now what happens is private IPs are not routable on the internet. What that means is if you are communicating with a private IP, you can't be reached from the internet. So if you can't be reached from the internet, people can't get back to you if you are sending them communications. So when you craft a packet, as Grayson presented, you have a source 
IP and a destination IP. Now, when this packet is generated from this host, it gets to the router. If this IP is private and this box is doing that, for this communication to get back to you, this IP needs to be a public IP. So what this box is going to do, it is going to remove the private IP and put the public IP here for that pack and then send the packet to the internet. So for devices on the internet here, communicating with you, they don't see your IP. They don't see your IP. So they are going to send back the packet to this router. And because this router keeps a table called the NAT network translation table, that is going to be, hello? Who is that? Oh, I need to mute everyone. Yeah. So what I was saying is, because this this um, router keeps what we call a a translation table, whereby you have the private IP and the port. You have the IP here and the port, the source port and the destination port. It will now recognize that this traffic is meant to be sent to this host. And what that's, that's what I just described is called the source nothing because the source IP address is what is nutted in this situation. But there are some situations where we want to use destination nothing. That is, we want to change the destination IP instead. Those situations where you have a single, let's say you have a single public IP, but behind this router, let me change the color of my pencil. Behind this router, you have what people mostly call, let's say, let's call it a DMZ, where you have many servers here. Let's say you have a web server, you have a proxy, you have DNS, and let's say for this web server, you want people outside your network to be able to access this. But on this server, you have only private IP addresses. How are you going to make this happen? You are going to create something here on this, um, on this device called destination translation, where let's say um, this application is running on port 80. You will now configure that for any queries that is coming on this IP, and that is going to port 80, forward it to the web server. Now what happens is when packets hit here, this device is going to change the destination IP and put the private IP of the web server and then channel that packet to the web server. So that's what is called destination. That's an example of use case for destination NAT. So there are many variants of destination NAT. You hear about things like PAT, which is port address translation. And the basic NAT always does PAT because each time you do a translation, each time you do, um, uh, let's say, let's say, um, I communicated to the rest of the world that my web server is running on port, say 80, 80. What happens when this packet gets here on port 80, 80, and maybe my, the real port of my web server is port 80 on that server? I will now do what we call here, I will switch the port from port 80. Not only I will change the destination IP, but I will also change the destination port to be port 80. So there are, there are lots of variants of, of NAT which we can present here and we'll never get <laughs> to the end. So I hope that is clear for you now about NAT. Let's move to the next question. So Grayson, over to you for the next question. The next question is uh, about subnetting. 
Um, I think I answered that one. Um, okay, cool. If you did that, then let's move because we are running out of time. Except if there's, if somebody has uh, like, if you need more clarity, just send a, a text, just, just send a message in the chat, then we'll pick that later. Thank you, uh, Grayson, for that uh, presentation. It was very, very in-depth. And um, we'll share the slides with other participants later. And any reference okay. material that you use, please uh, try to add to the, to, the, to the slides, and then we'll share that later. So now okay. we are going to give the floor to um, Manuela. Manuela, are you around? Yes. Hello. Um, it's, it's time for you. Can you listen to me? Yeah, yeah, I can get you. Okay. So you have 15 minutes presentation and then questions after. Okay. Can you see my screen? No, you see. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Hope you are, you all uh, doing well. My name is uh, Manuela Nononisi, and I am here to present you the sh chapter number six called Routing about our course. So, um, our discussion will be articulated around four points. The first one is about introduction to routing, the second one about network address translation, the third one about web proxies, and the fourth one about IP tunneling. Okay, so I want our discussion to be interactive. So I will choose two people among us to summarize me in their own words, the concept of uh, routing. So, I will choose uh, Natalie Rose if you are here. Natalie. Natalie is not here. She is. So let me, me unmute her. Okay. Okay, move on. Another person. Uh, Titus, if you are here, can you give me in your own words? the definition of uh, concept routing, if you are here. Okay, so thank you, let's move on. Okay. Uh, we can presume that, um, we can summarize that routing is uh, transferring a packet data from a source to a destination, finding um, the most suitable next hop towards the target matching between source and the destination. And the routing is also moving information across an internet work from a source to a destination. It's uh, very complex in large networks because of many potential intermediate nodes. Okay, um, just please get back to that definition and let's like okay. try to argue this. So Renata says um, routing is distribution. Uh, Diraj says routing is creating the path to send the packets. Mm -hmm. And Titus, Titus says uh, is finding the path. What do you think about those three? Um, I can say that the routing is a path. Okay, so we have a problem with your first okay. bullet point. When you say routing is transferring a packet data from a source to destination, do you think that's true? Do you guys think routing is transferring a packet data from source to destination? What do you guys think about that? What do you think about uh, bullet point three, moving information across an entire network uh, from a source to destination. Do you think that's routing? When, when, we, when I say routing is distribution, when we talk about distribution, is the, the whole thing. Like when you have to, um, if you 
if you are the in charge to put some things in other side, you have to think about the the whole thing. How I'm going to do it, where I'm going to put it, how how how. how. So that's why I say routing is distribution is because uh, the path that you are saying, but also the best way to do it, but also um, how I'm going to move this package or or how the package is going to uh, arrive to the other side is is what I what I think. I don't know if I'm wrong. Okay. So so now I have a question for you, uh, Manuela. Thank you, thank you, uh, Renata. That's that's um, a good intervention. I have a okay. question for Manuela and for all of you. Please tell me what you think forwarding is. Can you type in the chat box, all of you, please? What is forwarding or switching? What do you think switching is? Actually, switching is the same thing as forwarding. What do you think it is? Don't stop sharing your slides. Um, you, will, you will continue when we have this uh, done, please. Okay. So you can type in the chat. Um, so Jean-Claude say, on my hand, I understand it is a way of transmitting data from source to destination between nodes on networks. That's forwarding, right? So is there any difference between forwarding and routing? Sending a packet to the next node, forwarding. So what's the difference between forwarding and routing, according to you guys? This is very important. <laughs> People keep confusing these two words. Um, we are also looking for your text, uh, Manuela, um, or something. Yes. You, can, you can talk I, early. I think that uh, routing uh, refers to the network-wide process um, that determines end-to-end path that packet takes from source to destination. And uh, I think I think that uh, forwarding refers to the router local action of transferring a packet from an input link interface, I think. Okay, so we agree that bullet point one is not routing, it's actually forwarding. This is okay. forwarding or switching. And this as well, uh, moving information. So. Um, when actually when you present when you get to the to your presentation you will understand what I mean. If I want to define routing, routing is like building the network um, topology map. That is routing, and you will, when you will present you will tell us you will, I I know you get to a point where you will tell us that there are two ways of routing. There is static routing and there is dynamic routing, and by that same definition, if there is static routing, and if you define static routing as the concept by which a network administrator goes on the router and enter routes manually, then you understand that that entering routes manually is like you telling your router how to get to a specific destination. That's how you tell your router the infrastructure map. You tell your router how to get to each destination. You do that manually or dynamically. That is routing. So routing is building the network infrastructure map. That's how you define it. So uh, building network, uh, sorry, infrastructure map. That is routing according to me. So we can proceed. So now there is switching. Switching and forwarding are the same. There is switching at level two where you switch frames and there is switching at level three where you switch packets. Okay. All right. Next. Thank you for, for that. Okay. Can I move forward? Okay. Proceed. Go ahead. 
Okay. Uh, we have uh, some elements who are uh, used in routing. We have destination address, source address, and uh, policy based routing. Policy based, uh, based routing is uh, where routing decisions uh, depend on other source of information like MAC address, type of service, or network load. Um, here, um, uh, before, uh, because of lack of uh, public address, um, yes, lack of public address leads to the use of uh, network address translation technology which permit to translate from private address to, to public address. Uh, NAT. NAT is an internet standard that enables a LAN to use one set of IP addresses for internal traffic and the second set of addresses for in external traffic. Uh, people say that NAT is uh, popular because it allows single devices with a public to with a public address to represent a group of computers in a private network. So NAT is evil. <laughs> NAT is evil. Yeah. NAT breaks the end-to-end -end model. Okay. NAT complexifies network. Not um, stops. What will I say? Um, 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 discourages innovation. All right. Let me explain what I mean. So you know, internet has become very, very popular today because of the end-to-end -end model. And if you ask me what is the end-to-end -end model, the end-to-end -end model is when I am speaking to, say, Natalie, and I know her address, and I can send her a communication and talk to her. Let's take, uh, for instance, the, po the, the postal system. If I want to send you an, a letter, like in our traditional system, if I want to send a letter to a destination, I need to know the destination address of that person before I can send that letter. If not, I can't send it. So what NAT does is actually that NAT, which is like the postal agent, when I send that letter, NAT will open my letter and modify the content of my letter, basically the source or the destination address. And that is bad. If you want to understand why it's bad, look at uh, applications like Skype, Ask them how they did to get where they are. They had to develop extra. They had to like, it was very, very difficult for them to make Skype to work on NATED networks. If you look like, at things like IPsec, IP security, you will see that it is very difficult for you to configure IPsec and VPNs when you are using a NATED network. You have to use things like uh, NAT transversal. What I'm, when I'm talking about innovation, I'll look basically in Africa where there is a lot of NAT that uh, people use. If you look in universities, it is very difficult for us to create new applications because our students in university do not have public IP where they can host their applications. An example of application who got very popular is Facebook. Facebook became what it is today. I will say thanks to Zuckerberg having a public IP on his laptop. If he didn't have that IP, 
that public IP in, on his laptop, it wouldn't have been popular the way it is. The guy developed a web page where people could load cat picture and others could like and share. And because he was having a public IP on his server, he could distribute that public IP across the campus and people could now connect to his application. And you know, that is how Facebook became viral. That's just an example. This cannot happen if you are having a NATED network. If you look at managing a complex network with NAT, things like enforcing law enforcement will be very difficult. If you are having a DOS attack behind a NAT network, a NATED network, you can't easily identify who is the evil user behind that DOS attack. And let's say when you are, when I, I guess your network right now is NATED. Your network is NATED and you are sharing the same public IP with many of your neighbors. Imagine what of your neighbor goes and start, let's say, uh, uh, broadcasting and doing spamming, things like that. What will happen? On my end, if I start getting, let's say, spams from a specific public IP, I'm just going to block that public IP. And when I block that public IP, all the private IPs that are using that as a NAT public face are going to be affected. So NAT is evil. NAT came because we were running out of public IPs, V4 public IP addresses. And then we used things like VLSM, variable len subnet mask. We used things like CDIR, classless domain interrouting, to save their IP space. And then later on, in 1980s like that, we created NAT. And NAT was meant to be a, a short-term solution. In the years 1997, something like that, 1997, something good came out. It is called IPv6. Stop using NAT go to ipv6 because with ipv6 there are a lot of ip addresses for any device any object that is connecting to the internet so stop using NAT in your network most people use NAT and they say NAT is um is security that's bullshit so NAT is evil let's not use NAT. that's what i had to to say about NAT. so move on Okay. Uh, we have some um, future who require who require that to operate. We have a firewall or DMs and the DMZ like uh, like this at this picture. We have a traffic load balancing, comput computational load balancing. And uh, let me tell you that DMZ is a uh, demilitarized zone. It is a physical or logical subnetwork that contains and uh, exposes an organization's external facing service to an untrust network, usually a leisure network such as the internet. Um, we have two main functions of NAT. We have SNAT or IP masquerading. SNAT like source network address translation. Who um, who allows hosts with a private IP address to communicate with hosts outside their own network by letting another machine act on their behalf. IP um, masquerading is a uh, simple and uh, a limited 
form of uh, firewall. We have also DNAT, DNAT. DNAT like the destination network address translation is a technique for transparently changing the IP, uh, the destination IP address of an end route packet and performing the inverse function for any supply, any, any router located between two endpoints can perform this transformation of a packet. Now, take, uh, let's talk about uh, how to configure NAT on Cisco router. I will uh, show you after my presentation this link and uh, you will uh, follow step by step how to configure NAT on Cisco router. Uh, now let's talk about web proxies. Proxy is uh, a server that acts as a middleman between two hosts or the host on a network and the outside internet. Web um, proxies is uh, it. Uh, restrict internet to certain users. On uh, this picture, on this picture, uh, we can notice notice that a user has uh, a IP address 111.1.1.111 that one, that one, that and uh, he use the IP address of uh, the proxy server to access, to get access to internet. Uh, there is uh, so many uh, reasons to deploy proxies. We have a monitoring of uh, web website and traffic volume, restriction internet access by user, using caching to manage bandwidth usage. Uh, yeah, okay, here we have WCCP. WCCP is a web cache, cache control protocol who is used to tell the router that is alive and ready to process, to process web access requests. WCCP used also UDP protocol on port 240 and 48. There is uh, some advantage of using the WCCP. We have uh, multiple proxy servers, resilience to failure. This is uh, to, to access to internet. Um, the, the access to the internet will be, will be maintained if a proxy server fails. This is resilience to failure. We have uh, also op optimized caching. I, I, can, I want to notice that uh, WCCP is uh, only available on Cisco router and some high high end Cisco switches. Okay, um, okay. IP so suddenly about about, um, okay. about proxy and caching. It is very important to um, to, to 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 notice that to mention that. Um, Men, people in the same organizations or in the same house tend to like um, visit same web, web pages. So if you have like a catching server, then those pages, when they are visited by the first user, they are stored locally. So the next users won't have to go all the way 
on the internet to collect that uh, page. That page would be local. And it is, catching is very important for things like video streaming, um, DNS. Let's talk about video streaming. If you are using an application like, let's say, um, um, Netflix, Netflix, where you are uh, viewing a video, actually that video can be cached locally so that it doesn't buffer when uh, you, are, you are trying to watch or maybe another person is soliciting the same movie. And also DNS caching. The larger you have a local catch, the faster your internet goes. So caching is a very important, um, 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 right, let's say functionality of, uh, of the, the proxies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now let's talk about uh, IP tunneling. IP tunneling is uh, a technique that allows the transport of IP packets inside other, other IP packets. Like we can see on this picture, we have uh, this IP packet go through on the router and uh, be uh, encapsulated here before going on the next on the workstation to okay. IP uh, security or IPsec is uh, one common way to provide security of IP tunneling. It's uh, it is a set of protocol that ensure security on the IP level, support IP encapsulation, providing certain security properties. To have uh, more details about IP security, I will also I will uh, share with you this link on in our group after my presentation uh, okay some uh, benefits derived from ipsec use we have uh, confidentiality authentication and uh, integrity uh, the main technology of ipsec are authentication header who provide a strong cryptographic checksum. A, a correct checksum is uh, when uh, the packet originates from the intended sender and hasn't been modified during transfer. Encapsulation security payload or ESP provides strong um, encryption on the original known as payload. The decrypt packet ensure the protection of uh, the content of the packet. And uh, with uh, ESP, with a correct packet is uh, encrypted using a common shared secret between a source and a destination. Um, IPE, Internet Key Exchange, is um, a method is a method of setting a security association between two IP nodes. It hunts uh, negotiation between the two parties and leads to the public key between shares. It can be used uh, with uh, ESP. So I am at the end of my presentation. Your question and uh, recommendation are open. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Manuela. Um, we are now going to look at uh, the questions. So um, we'll start from the top and we'll be scrolling down. So um, 
For later atten attention, a few years uh, there was panic that IPv4 uh, addresses are running out and right, rightly so. How come IPv6 isn't deeply routed as we expected uh, by now? Ah, uh, that's a very tricky question because, um, you know, um, uh, people are expecting um, a killer application before they move to IPv4, but it's going to be very drastic when we get there. I would say um, we are improving. Right now, if you look at the globally, global deployment of IPv6, we are around something like uh, 39 to 40% deployment overall, like globally in the world. And uh, people are moving slowly, but they are getting there. It is definitely something that's going to happen because we have run out of IPv4 addresses. If you look at the uh, regional registries like uh, Arin, RIPE, and CC, uh, LACNIC, EPINIC, AFRINIC, right now all of them have, have run out of IPv4 addresses except AFRINIC, which is having less than, I think, less than a million of IPv4 addresses. So if you are a new ISP now, get into the internet, you have no other option than deploying IPv6. So yeah, sure. Major IP um, transit providers and uh, ISPs out there are having IPv6 routed in their backbone. So if you, are, if you are a customer and you need IPv6, you're definitely going to have it. Um, so yeah, that is it. Um, so uh, will you consider a network with several subnets a flat network and if one was to implement one thing between subnets and vlans what would you implement um one thing between subnet and vlan vlans um you always need to submit when you're doing vlan recommendation best practices when you're doing vlans is that for each vlan you need to have like a a, a subnet id so you must do uh, subnetting when you are doing VLANs. VLANs are pretty cool. Basically today, in today's world, you won't see a network without VLAN because VLAN have a lot of advantages. The first advantage is that it breaks down, um, like it creates more uh, broadcast domains whereby you can keep traffic depending on say application type or type of users. If you're in an organization where you have, let's say developers, you have uh, finance, you have the tech department. You don't want all of these departments to be sharing their communications. You want to keep communication depending on the department. And also applications, let's say you have uh, a DMZ where you have your, your servers. You want this DMZ to sit on a, a separate VLAN. If you are having strangers coming in the company, you don't want these strangers to be on the same network as the, uh, the, the, actually, uh, the actual staff in the company. You want to have like a visitor's VLAN where these people have access to limited resources. So VLAN is a must. And for each VLAN, you need a layer three network. Okay, so um, what's next? Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, is it possible to implement a proxy server without WCCP? Yeah, of course, if you don't want to like do um, some load balancing, you can do a simple uh, uh, proxy server. And, you know, basically for small networks, you don't have that, that much constraints. You just want a proxy server to do like um, say a first level filtering whereby um, you can decide which type of user is viewing which type of traffic on the internet and also for the caching caching purposes. So um, we have extended a lot, uh, almost two hours, no, one, one, one point three, one point, one point five hour. And uh, I would like to thank our presenters. Um, yeah, proxies create a fast connection due to caching. So if you are caching, instead of me going each time to the internet far away from my home to get a page, if that page is stored locally, I'll have it there. And if I have it, my internet is faster. 
Okay, so thank you everyone for participating. It was very interesting. Thank uh, um, Manuela and uh, Grayson. Thank you guys for, for sharing. Um, next meeting, we need volunteers. Next meeting, we need volunteers. And if you don't volunteer, I'm going to be, I'm going to select. So who is volunteering? So uh, next meeting, we are going to discuss module um, seven and module eight. So who is volunteering? Who is volunteering? Okay, I think it's my turn. Okay, Renata. Renata is going to work on module seven and Romero, Alejandro. Alejandro is gonna work on module eight. So we have our two presenters for next week. Same date, same time, be there. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for listening. See you next Sunday. Bye. By the way, Alejandro, I hope it's okay for you, Alejandro. Please acknowledge and confirm that you are going to present module eight next week. Alejandro, you are listening. All right, cool. So thank you guys. Um, please, uh, Grayson and um, Manuela, send your slides to me through email and I will share with the rest of the class. I'm going to um, uh, share the the recording of this week and last week on YouTube and send you guys the link. Thank you. Goodbye.